Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a director of Williams Hybrid Power, um, having obviously been involved in Formula One for a very long time. But the hybrid power activity was something we got into when uh, energy recovery came into Formula One. Um, for various reasons that I won't go into, we haven't actually applied it in Formula One, but it has been applied successfully um, in the case of uh, with Porsche, who I must com commend because some three years ago they identified the electromechanical flywheel as being uh, the energy store of their choice in their, what was their GT3, which is a uh, racing version of their Carrera uh, GT3 hybrid and they've raced it a number of times uh, mostly successful successfully um, it won a, a significant race in Zuhai in Japan um, and was also I think leading at the Nürburgring 24 hours when an accident uh, and then a failure within the ICE actually put it out after 23 hours or so in the, the lead of the Nürburgring 24-hour race. So it was uh, a very good first application. The very good thing about motorsport is in generally if you can offer something uh, significant, uh, you can actually raise uh, funding um, for R&D and that's very difficult to do as many people uh, will find in that field. Um, and following on from Porsche, we then uh, did a special version, much lighter, higher power density unit for Audi, which came first and second at Le Mans. The e-tron system, as they refer it to, is an Audi energy recovery system. Uh, or Williams Hybrid Power Supply is the er energy storage device. The whole system is um, uh, a hybrid is a is a an Audi unit thing. Uh, I was really just going to run through not a great thing on the mechanical flywheel, but literally just an explanation of of what it really is. Um, in the it's uh, a composite flywheel runs at typically 40, 50,000 RPM in a vacuum, um, which, uh, and it would, it's only able to do so by virtue of being a carbon fiber flywheel. The sort of interesting and, and uh, if you like, peculiar uh, advantage to it really came out of the uh, nuclear industry. Um, from a company called Urenco that supplies the nuclear industry and um, uh, was developed for high-speed centrifuges for making yellow cake, I suppose. But um, uh, so, and therefore, there's, there was a certain amount of security on it. But what was automotive hybrid power um, acquired the technology and some of the people that had been involved at Urenco. Um, and the specific bit is the use of what's called MLC, magnetic loaded composite, which is loading the magnetic element within the flywheel, which is particulate um, laid in glass, filament wire and glass fiber. And it's able to be, in effect, the magnets can be orientated within the particles uh, after it's filament wound. I've got a slide here which is, just compares the available technologies, obviously batteries, super caps or ultra caps, uh, a mechanical flywheel and uh, an uh, electro-mechanical flywheel. I'm certainly not here to sell any of you um, electro-mechanical flywheels, but I was really just wanted to do a, uh, an explanation of what in effect it is. Um, one of the advantages is you can place the electromechanical fly flywheel within reason anywhere within the vehicle. Um, and at the moment, we, we've just completed an installation in conjunction with GKN um, on a bus, and it's sitting somewhere under a rear seat, I think, but in, in no way encroaches on the, on the remainder of the bus. There's a, 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 an MGU tied into the drivetrain, um, an inverter managing the flywheel and the uh, MGU, and in effect you're just taking retard energy uh, from the bus, putting it into the flywheel, and then putting it back into the um, uh, linear performance of the bus uh, afterwards. Um, 
that I will jump. This is a picture of lines and lines of uh, high-speed centrifuges. It's really just showing that the technology has been around for years. Um, uh, as is said in this slide, a lot of these um, high-speed centrifuges have been running non-stop 24 hours a day, uh, 365 odd days a year for 20 years. Uh, they have the advantage of having very advanced uh, magnetic and, and different types of bearings and that's really the interesting transfer to the automotive side on the flywheel uh, is to overcome the problems with bearings which are in effect running in a vacuum um, and getting them to last reliably uh, for five or even more years uh, running without any maintenance and that's one of the challenges that we have been dealing with and uh, ongoing. Yes, this is a picture of the flywheel. You can see carbon filament. That's the, in effect, the containment is around the outside. It obviously contributes some of the mass as well. And then on the inside, that's actually a glass fiber ring, uh, which has got the um, particulate uh, magnetic element in it. The advantage of it, there are many advantages of it, A, for containment, B, in the way it fails, if ever it did fail. C, uh, and very significant, is the fact that the particles are so small that we don't develop really any significant eddy current losses and heating as a result and uh, contributes to very high efficiencies in energy flow both ways. Um, so that's a cross-section of the flywheel. And... Um, uh, that's a picture of the external. Obviously, the containment has to deal with uh, either a, an intact flywheel failure, which would be, say, bearing failures where the whole flywheel loses its location, and it has to deal with that from uh, 40,000 RPM or so. Um, uh, obviously... Uh, uh, and it's the, the advantages of the carbon and the MLC allow us to make containment that isn't too severe, but we've done a, num a number of intact um, uh, rotor failures. The other type of failure would be a rotor burst, but that's dealt with in a, in a completely different way. Nice advertising picture of the Porsche. This was the car that it's run in, uh, and they've been running it for uh, two years or so in a number of different races. The... The good thing about it, um, here am I showing you a PowerPoint, but instead of going around to potential customers saying, this is the flywheel we've been designing and manufacturing, um, it could be very good for you, we can actually at least demonstrate that the, the, the technology is running successfully out in the field. And uh, in the case of the, this is a diagrammatic of the installation in the Porsche, and this is the Audi car that finished first and second at Le Mans. Uh, again, Williams just provided the storage um, medium instead of being batteries, or in the case of the Toyota it was competing against, um, was, uh, they use uh, supercapacitors, so it has a different characteristic. But, um, uh, but again, 24 hours is only 24 hours, but it's... Uh, it's a practical demonstration of capability uh, and the fact that the unit doesn't come back immediately to be stripped and tested, it, it, it has significant life and during that life there's no degradation. It has equal performance at the end of its life as it does at the, at the beginning. Um, obviously safety is a very important factor, um, performance, reliability and it particularly says bearing life here. There's obviously a lot of other factors. Very interesting one for us at the moment is cost. The, um, it's obviously all very well developing small numbers of units for motorsport activities, which will bear quite high costs. The challenge for Williams Hybrid Power has been over the last two or three years to try and go through a cost down. And it's a very interesting thing managing a small development company while you're going through a cost down exercise because while we're providing relatively small numbers, tens, twenties, thirties of flywheels, it's very difficult to deal with uh, suppliers who provide us with parts 
um, and tell them, yes, we're going to be ordering thousands in two years' time, so please give us a price associated with thousands. They basically will always deal with us on the basis of the actual numbers of parts we're buying at the time. So it's a, it's a progressive road to getting the cost down. Uh, this is a slide to do with failure. We've obviously done lots of both analytically and practically then following up practical tests on failures. We've had numbers of people saying that flywheels wouldn't be safe on vehicles, flywheels doing 40, 50,000 RPM on vehicles, and obviously that's one of the things one has to be able to demonstrate is that the, any type of failure that could occur is contained within the unit itself. This is just an interesting thing. That's a, an American V8 engine, very similar to American V8 engines from the 1950s, I would think, but it's probably a more modern one but they probably look very similar. And apparently the American car companies can produce those with that many parts for under $1,000. The challenge for us is to produce the flywheel here, and you see a, a, an expanded view of the components, and get the price uh, right down on these units. Uh, a typical motorsport unit is in the 30000 um, pounds per unit, i.e. very significant cost. Meanwhile, in comparison to the type of lithium-ion battery pack, he would have to replace it. Uh, I'm not going to use the word cheaper or more expensive, but uh, the costs of many of you will know of these battery packs are very significant. Um, the volume costs will be very much less than the 30,000 pounds, but we're, it's, it's a road journey we're on. Um, and we're soon to be testing, or the, the company, uh, I think it's in the public domain, Go Ahead, are uh, going to be evaluating a bus, I think, starting within the next week or two. And if that is successful in driving their fuel costs down, uh, they um, are looking for more than 15%. Uh, we've obviously done very significant simulations on their urban cycles, uh, and we're pretty confident it'll achieve that and more. Um, but uh, that is only a start. Uh, if it's successful, they'll be saying, okay, we want more, and that's what we've been working on at Williams is actually a media, small to medium volume uh, production capability capable of producing up to 1,000 a year. We probably can push it to 2,000 a year over the next two or three years. But uh, it's, it's a journey. Ultimately, as a technology, if it's very significant, we will have to partner with a big company, um, Siemens, GKN, whoever it might be. But uh, a much bigger company will have to uh, pick it up and uh, get into volume production. And I'm sure then they'll be doing uh, a, a second, much bigger stage on uh, cost down for it. But it's a different technology. So far, it's proved itself successfully. Audi are going to be running again with the same unit next year, obviously lighter, faster. Um, as typically in, in motorsport, nothing can stay the same, albeit that it'll be the, the same basic unit, but just push much harder than, uh, than it has been this year. I had a very interesting trip here from an island off Sardinia this morning. So it was a fairly interesting, colourful trip, but uh, made slightly amusing by the taxi driver who picked me up from my home and brought me here, uh, the man who got stuck on the other side of Tower Bridge. And uh, he was one of these very chatty taxi drivers. Um, and uh, he asked me why I was going to City Hall. And I said, well, I've got to talk for a little bit about ecology and transport. And he immediately... He said, get rid of half the buses. He said, there are far too many buses, and they hold up all the traffic. And get rid of all the cyclists as well. They hold up the traffic and slow everything down. And he was quite convinced that that would be a very significant improvement in uh, transport costs in London. It might benefit him as well. But, uh, but I do uh, just want to say, I mean, as I said, in the, it, with Go Ahead, uh, our... Um, electromechanical flywheel unit will have to stand up to rigorous back-to-back -back tests and prove itself in a real uh, or quasi-real environment and then in a real environment actually on the, the roads of London, uh, which I think will be uh, part of the test. It's now really gaining big momentum, these technologies 
uh, into transport, some of it with the help of uh, regulation, uh, which I think is quite appropriate, as long as it's put behind real, genuine uh, benefit. And because uh, we saw at the end of the last millennium in America, uh, a lot of federal support behind, particularly in California, as most of you will know, they had this 5% electric vehicle um, law by the year 2000, and a lot of money was spent federally on programs um, that were supposed to achieve that. And, and most of it, in terms of actually achieving the aim, was a complete failure. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the money genuinely went towards developing um, technologies which have sped up the process of interest, introducing hybrids and EVs uh, onto the road. But I think we've gone through the first stage of uh, EVs and hybrid technologies on the road, and I think now uh, the, the, the starry-eyed brigade um, have, have sort of gone away, and the investors, I think, are pretty tough about seeing uh, real, genuine improvement um, uh, which is good, and um, uh, on, I must say on uh, William's hybrid side, we're very happy and very pleased to be part of it. And I think that's all I have to say, Stephen. Okay. Thanks.